Okay, guys, so we're going to go ahead and record this, okay? So let's just take a look at Chapter 9 slides, and uh, we're going to talk about current liabilities, okay? And we already know that current liabilities are liabilities that will be liquidated essentially in one year or less, right, is our rule of thumb for that, okay? Um, or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. Operating cycle, remember we said, is the amount of time that it takes you to turn your inventory into cash, right? So if you're a sushi restaurant, is your operating cycle one year or less than one year? It's less than one year, so current asset would be used up what? In one year. If we're talking about, I don't know, Jack Daniels, a whiskey you know, company or something, then their operating cycle is probably going to be longer than one year so theoretically an asset that what that would be used up in more than a year could still be considered a current asset right so you go by the operating cycle or one year whichever is what longer okay for this class one year is our rule of thumb and we'll continue to use that okay now we come over and we talk about how to deal with a bank note okay and so we go ahead and we borrow some money I forgot my stylus we uh, borrow a hundred thousand dollars and they tell us here that the interest rate on that is how much she looks for the pen it is what 12 percent holy Toledo these people are crazy okay so what happens that's a pretty high interest rate these days right so when I was going to college 12 percent was considered great the interest rates were like 20 percent at that time and uh, for a long time everyone thought that we were just going to be killed by interest rates you'll never get a house with interest rates like that and then they started coming down around the 80s 82 and now interest rates fluctuate right they go up they go down they've been hovering around four or five percent for some time okay but anyway they're using this 12 percent and it's a four year note now they borrow the money on what on January 1st and they're asking us to uh, oh it matures on January 1st and they borrow the money what on September 1st so that's pretty easy if you borrow money you're gonna get cash and you're gonna have a bill a liability you're gonna have account payable right okay now we come to December 31st and is this note maturing yet it won't mature until the next year right but we're gonna have to accrue interest for the what all of September all of October all of November all of December for the four months that this note has been outstanding aren't we so we're going to go ahead and we're going to take that hundred thousand we're going to multiply it by this outrageous what 12 percent interest rate and then we're going to multiply that by four months out of the 12 right okay and that's going to give us an amount here which is this uh, four thousand dollars that's the interest for what for September October November December the four months from the time we borrowed the money until the end of the year right so we'll go ahead and we'll accrue that interest and I'm just gonna go ahead and erase that now since I wrote it there it's down there at the bottom and we're going to go ahead and debit interest expense for four thousand credit interest payable for four thousand and then we will go ahead and do what pay that I guess presumably the next day right okay so the next day we'll do what we'll go ahead and we'll of course have to pay back the principal does anybody let you uh, borrow money and only let you pay interest no, no. <laughs> it's not a trick question no short answer nobody will do that so of course you have to do what you have to pay back the principal and of course you have to pay the interest right okay question yeah Paul yeah No, pay a bill. This is the person that's borrowing, right? So they got cash. Oh, they, got cash. Oh, yeah. they got cash and they're paying the interest on it now. Uh, they're paying the interest and they're going to pay the principal back, right? Okay. Right? So it's an interest expense because things like interest expense, rent expense, they accrue with the passage of time, don't they? I mean, nothing has to happen. Time just has to pass and rent expense accrues. Time just has to pass and interest accrues, right? So when you're calculating things like that, it's based on time, right? When we were dealing with other things like our what, like our revenues, we had to actually 
do something, right? To take the, we had to provide the service or whatever. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and, uh, oh, no payroll accounting, guys. Sorry. If you got these payroll things, don't worry about it. We're not doing payroll accounting in here. Okay. Unearned revenue, you already know. You already know unearned revenue, right? You get the cash in advance before you've provided the service or whatever. You debit the uh, unearned, uh, the cash. You credit the unearned, and then as you earn it, you debit the earned. You credit, you debit the unearned. You credit the earned. Easy for me to say, right? Okay, you know this already. Unearned ticket revenue is a liability. Remember, uh, the courts don't think it's too cute if you sell somebody something and then stiff them and don't provide the service. So you'll be liable to give them their money back, wouldn't you? So that unearned revenue is a liability. That's correct. Okay. Question? All right, good. So uh, working capital, I'm not going to get into. Okay, I guess I could get into working capital by this question. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. That is defined as working capital. That is saying that if you had to quickly liquidate, what would you have left over to cover your what? To cover your liabilities, right? Okay. And so do we want the uh, current assets minus current liabilities, do we want that number to be positive? Yes, we do, right? So our working capital is going to be our current assets minus our current liabilities. That difference is working capital. We want that number to be positive, right? Do we want it to be hugely positive? We want it to be what? Reasonably positive, but we don't want this huge, huge number because the question would then be, why are you hoarding your current assets, right? And guys, you already know current ratio, don't you? We already talked about that, current assets divided by current liabilities, turning that working capital calculation into a ratio. Obviously, we want that number to be greater than one. We don't want that number to be outrageously huge either, right? Okay. Question about chapter nine. Okay. <laughs> chapter nine. <laughs> What's the number of that truck that just hit me? It's chapter nine. <laughs> Current liabilities. <laughs> what? That is that's it, right? Current liabilities? The what? Why do we care about it? Current ratio is basically we're wanting that number to be positive because it's showing us the ratio for every you know dollar of liability we have a dollar and 43 cents in this example of as current assets right so if something you know horrible happened and our position came that we just have to sort of quickly liquidate we'd grab our current assets we'd quickly liquidate them and then we'd have the cash to pay off our current liabilities right now is there a problem with this number huh well, no, some people look at that and say it is not quite the critical measure of solvency that we would like it to be because it is inventory a current asset? Well, what if you're a cell phone company and you've got flip phones? Are you going to be able to sell those real quickly? I mean, maybe if you go to like, you know, an old folks home, you know, because my dad, he has to have a flip phone, right? If you hand him a smartphone, dad, I got you a smartphone. What am I supposed to do with it? Where's my flip phone, right? So there are some uses for flip phones, but you're not going to sell them out like you, you know, some people will want to buy them, but you're not going to sell them out like you would iPhones, right? And so whatever, you know, whatever your smart favorite smartphone is, you're not going to sell them out quite, quite as quickly. So some uh, people will say you shouldn't include inventory in your current ratio assets, in the assets part, right? How about prepaids? Prepaids. Can you liquidate them quickly? I would say you can't liquidate them at all. Try it sometime. Go to Safeway and say, hey, I've got some prepaid insurance. Can I have some milk? Safeway's going to say, no, you got any cash on you? So prepaids are also a current asset, but they're pretty hard to liquidate, right? So there are some people that would prescribe to something called the quick ratio. Quick ratio would take out our inventory and take out our um, prepaids out of the numerator to calculate the quick ratio. I won't hold you accountable to that unless you want me to. Okay. 
if the it, I don't know if it should go bankrupt, but you better find a way to get some current assets pretty quick because these current liabilities are probably on a 30-day leash, right? And it's not too long before that pit bull is turning around and saying, I want some meat. And if you don't have the meat to give it, which is, I got chased by a pit bull a couple of times. So I got chased by pit bulls twice. I was running back when I used to run, believe it or not. Okay, And I was running, and it's all of a sudden these, these one pit bull and a mutt start chasing me, right? And I can't, huh? in Hayward, of course, and I can't get away from them. I tried the old, ha, ah! and they ran away, and that worked once. And when I ran, when I started to run, they came back after me. So now this guy's driving by in a minivan with his kid, and he sees what's happening, and he starts driving the minivan towards the dogs to get them off me. In the meantime, I go around, and I get in his back seat, you know, big sweaty Puerto Rican. Now sitting in the poor guy's back seat. I'm like, he goes, where do you want to go? I'm like, out of here. So he took me out. Then the other time, this is in Castro Valley where I had my house for a while, I'm running and the dog starts chasing me and I can't get away from this one. And so I finally had to go ahead and bam, gave him a kick and he goes, Nyar! and took off the other way. So I got rid of that one. Again, a pit bull. So then from then on, I started jogging with a bat. So now I'm running down the street with the bat and then the Alameda County Sheriff say, where are you going? I'm like, I'm just running. Dog's chasing me. Oh, okay. Anyway, but... It was an aluminum bat, so any time a dog came up to me after that, I would just ping the bat on the ground, and the dogs would get it, would take off. I don't know. Must be my sweet disposition that dogs just can't resist me, right? Okay. So anyway. <laughs> is prepaid what? Prepaid is a current asset. Inventory is a current asset. Remember our list of current assets, right? Okay. Okay. Good. So let's go ahead then and let's discard this and let's get ourselves into chapter 10, which is the real um, area where we're going to see some interesting material for your test, okay? So let me see if I can do it this way. Another question? Uh-huh. A pit bull and a mutt? Accounts receivable and what, sir? I can explain the difference. Accounts receivable, okay, is where I've already provided the service and I haven't gotten the cash yet. Okay, so when I've already provided the service and I haven't gotten the cash yet, you would go ahead and debit accounts receivable. I don't know, $1,000, whatever, and you would credit the sales for $1,000, right? Okay, now we've provided the service. We haven't gotten the cash, so we took the sales, we took the revenue, whatever, right? Unearned revenue is the mirror image of that situation, and that we get the cash. I'm going to use a different number, 2000 and we credit what? We credit the unearned revenue because we um, haven't done that work yet, right? So here we've already done the work. We're just waiting for the cash. Here we got the cash. We got to do the work, right? Okay. Now, as we start to uh, collect on the cash in the first situation with accounts receivable, we will debit cash for, I don't know, 700 whatever the amount is. I'm just making it 700 because we don't have to collect it all at once. And we'll credit the account receivable, right? Notice there's no revenue being taken at that point, right? For the unearned revenue, as we provide the service, we'll do what? We will debit the unearned. And I'm just making the number up, 1,500, because we don't have to earn it all at once. And now we'll credit revenue because now we've earned that, right? So the takeaway from that is cash is not the thing that triggers the recognition of revenue. It's what? Providing the service, right? Okay. Question? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at bond payable. Okay. And when we look at bond payable, we have different types of bonds. Uh, we have something called term bonds. And in this class, we are going to study 
term bonds. Guys, I don't understand what the ongoing conversation is that goes on through the whole class, but please stop it, okay? All right, so what happens? We sit here and we have our term bonds, and term bonds will have a specific maturity date. Okay, I want to use highlighter here. We'll have a specific maturity date, okay? So if I have a five-year bond, what's the term of the bond? Five years. Good. Very good. Okay. If I have a five-year bond, the term is five years. Okay. I'm just going to start that. Now, you can also have something called convertible bonds. Okay. Convertible bonds, people like those because they can convert them into stock. They can convert them into stock. So what happens? You give me the bond, I'll give you the stock of the company. So you can change that into stock. We also have callable bonds. Callable bonds are callable by the issuer. Callable bonds are callable by the issuer. So what happens? I issue a bond to you. And the term of the bond is five years. If the bond is callable, I can call the bond after, say, three years. Now, why would I do that? I've borrowed money from you for five years. I issued you a bond. I don't have to pay you back for five years. But I decide that I'm going to call it after three years. Why would a company do that? Huh? So I don't have to pay the interest, but likely what's happened? Very good. Yeah. Interest rates have gone, what, has likely gone down since the time I bought the bond. So it's sort of like, what, refinancing your house or something, right? You had a, yes, got it right. We, uh, we sit here and we uh, have an interest rate of 4%, and now interest rates are 3%. We'll go ahead and we'll do what? We'll call that bond. We'll pay the cash out. And even if you're saying, but hey, you still need to borrow that cash, fine. Issue new debt at a lower interest rate, right? Okay, good. Those are callable bonds. Now, we're not going to get much up into that in this class. What we're going to do in this class is focus on the mechanics of these term bonds, okay? I think I heard somebody saying at the very beginning of this class, uh, I think it was the, whoever your teacher is for the managerial class, he was saying, well, financial is what? A procedural class, okay? And you can see that that's what we've been doing, right? We've been looking at procedurally, what do you debit, what do you credit? We're going to continue that discussion here, okay, now for bonds. So when we go ahead and we issue bonds, it represents a promise to pay, and we're going to have to pay the amount that we borrow back at maturity, and then we will have periodic interest payments. And those periodic interest payments typically are semi-annually. Semi-annually means how many times a year? Twice a year. Good. Okay, so we'll have what? We'll have two semi-annual interest payments per year. Okay, and so uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look. And this is a bond specimen. Okay, and uh, do you see bonds like this anymore? How do bonds exist nowadays? Book entry, right? They're simply what? On somebody's computer somewhere? In fact, the issuer of the bond, the company, even if you buy their bond, they don't know you. They don't know your address. They don't know who you are. They know what? Whoever the underwriter was, Schwab or whatever that did what? That helped them to take those bonds to market. And then from there, it gets sold on a secondary market to you. Okay? And all of that exists in book entry. Okay? Now, in this example, we are doing the accounting for who? For the borrower, not the investor in the bonds. Time permitted, I will quickly show you what the investor with bonds would do, but that is beyond the scope of this class. When you get into intermediate two, we'll start talking to you about how to account for bond investments. Okay? But I'll show you a little bit of that if we have time. time. Okay? Okay, now we go over and we take a look here and we need to determine, we need to start to understand if a bond is going to issue for more than face or less than face. Okay, face is the amount if they still printed bonds is what would be painted, painted, what would be printed on the face of the bond, right? 
okay? And so if we have a bond that is a $100,000 bond, the face of that bond would be 100000 Now, when the bond issues, it'll issue for more than face or less than face, depending on the difference between the contractual interest rate. Contractual interest rate is basically, just humor me that bonds are still printed, okay? It's printed on the face of the bond, right? That contractual rate will not change throughout that bond's life. If it's a five-year bond, it'll be 10% contractual rate interest for the entire five-year life, okay? Now, what happens? The market rate fluctuates, doesn't it? Market rate fluctuates, and we can't control that. So if the bond and the market rate were exactly the same, the bond would issue for face value, okay? But let's say that the bond's stated contractual, stated contractual rate are synonymous terms. Let's say that the bond's contract rate is 10%, but the market rate is 8%. Would you like to have that bond? The what? bond's paying 10 when the market's only giving what? 8%. So that bond will issue at a premium. That bond will issue at what? More than what? More than the face value, right? So it's going to be, I don't know, 108,395. I don't know. I'm just making the number up here, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, if the market rate is more than the contract stated rate, in this case, the market rate is 12%, will the contract rate change? Will the contract rate change? Contract rate stays the same. It stays at 10%. It won't change, but the market rate could change. And if the market rate became 12%, now the market rate's more than the contract rate. Do you want that bond? You're sitting there saying, I don't want that silly little bond. It's only paying what? 10% when the market's paying 12. So if you're going to buy that bond, you're going to buy it at a discount. You will buy it at what? Less than face. Okay, so if market rate equals contract rate, the bond issues at face. If what? If the contract rate is more than the market rate, the bond issues at a premium, it issues at more than face, right? If we're in a situation where the market rate is more than the contract rate, the bond will issue at a discount. It'll issue at what? Less than face. Okay, all right, good. Now we come over and uh, we take a look at this example. And uh, we're sitting here, and we have this bond that is a million-dollar bond, okay? That is the face of the bond. Okay? And we have a 10% coupon rate. If it's a 10% coupon rate, that is the same as saying contract rate. Contract rate stated rate and coupon rate are all synonymous terms. Contract rate, stated rate, coupon rate, all synonymous terms. The contract rate is what? 10%. It is a five-year bond. That five years is what? The term. And if it pays interest on June 30th and December 31st, that bond is said to be what? Semi-annual. Semi-annual means that it'll pay interest, what? Two times a year, and they tell us it's June 30th and December 31st, right? Now, they tell us that it's going to pay $50,000 every six months. Where do we get that $50,000? You take the million. That's the face of the bond, isn't it? You multiply it by that coupon stated contract rate. Those terms are synonymous. That's 10%. And then you multiply that by what? One half to get the 50,000 because when we call out interest rates, we call them out at their annual amount. But what? We have two interest payments per year, so we have to multiply that by one half, don't we? So this bond pays how much? $50,000 every six months, doesn't it? 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000 every six months for five years. How many payments is that? Ten. ten payments, right? Ten payments. Every five years, two payments. That's ten payments. 
And then at the end of that tenth period, we also have to pay the dude back the principal, don't we? So these bonds are cash flows, aren't they? They're $50,000 every six months and then the million dollars back at the end. So the question becomes, what would somebody be willing to pay today for the right to receive what? 10 payments of $50,000 plus one payment at the end, a million, right? So it's 1,500,000. So would you be willing to give somebody $1,500,000 right now today for the right to receive $1,500,000 of which you have to wait five years to get all the money back? No, that would be a horrible business decision, wouldn't it? So you look at the guy and you say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you less than 1,500,000 and then you pay me back 1,500,000, 50,000 every six months for the next five years and then the million dollars at the end. That's a better deal, isn't it? Okay, what we just described is the time value of money. Time value of money says what? Says that if I have to wait to receive my cash, then I'm going to sit there and only be willing to give you less cash in order to receive my cash back over time. Okay, so the process that we're going to be talking about using the time value of money is called discounting. We are going to discount these cash flows to determine what we should pay today for this bond. Okay, so how do we do that? When we discount the cash flows, guys, and let's just remember this is the same bond, it's still a million dollars. Will the contract rate change? Will the term of the bond change? Still five years, still semi annual bond, June 30th and December 31st, and there's my 50,000s, right? How did I come up with the 50,000s? It's a million times what? Times 10% times what? One half. There's my 50,000s, right? That's not going to change. 50,000 is going to stay the same because the coupon rate, the stated rate, the contract rate won't change, right? And then what? And then I have to pay the guy back a million dollars at the end, okay? So the only thing that has changed here now is that we now have this what? We now have this market rate of interest is... 12%, isn't it? Okay, so the market rate is now going to be higher than the coupon rate, right? Where'd it go? Right here? Right? Okay, so is this bond going to issue for more than face or less than face? You know already this bond's going to issue for less than face, isn't it? Because the market wants 12%, the bond's only paying 10%. So all we're going to look at right now is the mechanics as to how we will calculate that amount that's going to be paid, that amount that's less than face. So we'll sit here and we will use these factors up here and we will take the 12%. We'll take the 12%. Is that the market rate of interest? We divide it by 2, that equals what? That's the semi interest. That gives me the semi, the market rate of interest at semi-annual, right? 6% on a semi-annual basis. And then we have how many periods? We have 5 years times what? 2 semi-annual periods. So we've got 10 periods. We've got 10 payments, don't we? we got 10 payments. Okay. So we, yeah, so we come over. And we take a look, we have the 10 payments, 6%, and we start to look at these factors. And we can see that we have what? We have 6% for 10 periods here, and we have 6% for 10 periods here, don't we? Now you're saying, well, why did you list all those other periods and years? Well, this might be a problem where you'd have to sit there and figure out which factors you should pick up for your present value calculation. So we look for what? 6%, the 12% divided by 2, and it was... 10 payments, the five years, two payments a year, right? And we found what? We found the present value of a dollar is 0.55839. That's for the principal. That's for the principal. And then we're sitting here and we have what? We have this present value of an annuity. That's for the interest, okay? Annuity, guys, means a stream of payments. When we talk about annuity, we're talking about a stream of payments. 
So when you retire, how much do you want to be making a month when you retire? Well, whatever. 20 years from now, okay. Since you're making me pick a number. I mean, how do I know how long you're going to live? What? 50000 a month? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so take a look at that and see how much you got to have going in to get 50000 a month. Yeah, I know, and I'm just telling you. <laughs> try it sometimes. You look at actuarial tables, guys. There's no good news in them, okay? But anyway, so you're going to get 50000 okay? Oh, and you're saying this is the question, 50000 Oh, I get it. Okay, good. So what happens? You want 50000 a month, and so what's going to happen? That 50000 a month is called an annuity because it is a stream of equal payments. We call that an annuity. So we pick up that factor for the interest. Okay. Now what happens? You come over and you get the present value of that annuity by doing what? Taking the 50,000 and multiplying by the present value of the annuity factor. That gives you the present value of the interest, doesn't it? Right? Take the present value of the annuity factor. That gives you the present value of the interest. You then go ahead and pick up that present value of the dollar factor. That's for the principal. How many principal payments are we going to get back? One. So if it's a one-time payment, we call that present value of a dollar. We pick up that factor. We multiply that. And I suppose we could have gone ahead and wrote in the million. Why is this thing doing this? So we go ahead and we write that in, the million dollars. Okay. And we multiply that. And that gives me the present value now of the principal, doesn't it? I add the present value of the principal, the present value of the interest together, and I get this $926,395. Did the bond issue at less than face? Did the bond issue at less than face? What was the face of the bond? One million, and it issued for 926, 395. So there is a discount on this bond, isn't there? The discount on this bond is 73,605. So when I go ahead and I make my journal entry now for the issuance of this bond, right? Accountants do it with journal entries. I will, and you kind of see it squeezed in down here at the bottom. I'll debit cash for the amount of cash that I'm borrowing, 926395 I will debit my discount on bond payable, and I will credit bond payable for the face of the bond, the full million. Okay? Now, when I prepare my balance sheet, And I'm just going to do my liability section here, guys. Is bond payable a liability? Is bond payable a liability? Okay. What's the amount of my bond payable? Don't use your imagination. Bond payable is a million. And then I will show the discount on that, which is 73605 I'll show that as a subtract, and so my what net bond payable is 926,395, right? Will my balance sheet balance? This is the only transaction I had. I got cash up there, 926,395. I got a net bond payable, 926,395, don't I? Right? Okay. Now, we call the discount a contra liability. I keep getting that question. What do we mean by contra? Opposite, against. It's the opposite, isn't it? So since the bond payable was a credit, the discount's a debit. It's going to reduce the, what, the total carrying value of this bond payable down to 926395 which is the amount of cash I got, right? Question? Okay, Peter. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead then and let's take a look and let's just see where these factors came from, okay? So what happens? Remember we were looking at the what? At the principal, right? And we had that one payment and we had the factor for that, okay? So what happens? You take 12%, you divide it by two, that's 6% semi-annually, right? We have a five-year bond, two payments, that's 10 periods, isn't it? And if you were to use this present value table, you would go ahead and you would find 6%. There it is. You would go ahead and come down and find how many payments? 
10 payments, and is that that factor they were using? Okay, 5.55839. Okay, and that was the factor that they used for the principal. So we had to go to the present value of the dollar table, right? Now, if we're trying to get the present value of the interest, we go ahead and we come to the present value of the ordinary annuity. We come to the present value of the annuity table, right? Ordinary annuity means that the payments are made at the end of the period. If we call it an annuity due, the payments would be made at the beginning of the period. Okay, I'm not going to have you do annuity due problems in here, but ordinary annuity will just assume payments are made what at the end of the period. Okay, and so we come over, and what was our interest rate? What was our interest rate? It was 12% divided by two. Yes, it was 6%. How many periods? 10 periods okay so is there the 10 periods and six percent so that gives me a factor of 0 0.736009 is that the factor that they use in this problem huh there it is right now you see where they got the factor for the interest question you just can't see okay should be up on your computer you can come sit right here where you can see. Okay. Can you define annuity again? Annuity is a stream of payments. Dude's annuity is a stream of equal payments. 50,000, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000 every six months for the next five years is an annuity. 50,000 for the rest of your life when you retire is an annuity. If you hit the lottery, they'll pay you. They say you can have a lump sum or you can have an annuity. Right? Because you can get a, st a stream of payments. Okay. Now, when you look at these tables, guys, sometimes our students say, oh, I can't ever remember what table I'm supposed to be on. Well, look, notice that on the present value of the dollar table, all of the numbers are less than one, aren't they? Aren't the numbers less, all less than one? And they have to be less than one because what? It's a one-time payment, and we already said that the present value has to be less, doesn't it? So you know all the numbers have to be less than one on the present value of the dollar table. So if you're ever confused at what table you're on, if the numbers are less than one, that's the present value of the dollar table, uh, table, right? If you look at the present value of the annuity table, all of the payments are more than one because it's what? More than one payment, except the first row. And the first row is what? One payment, which means it's not an annuity. If I was the president, I would immediately, you know how Trump signs executive action? The first thing I would do is I'd sign one and say, take the one payment row off of all annuity present value tables because that's not an annuity if it's one payment, right? All the other numbers after that first payment are what? Are more than one and they have to be more than one because it is more than one payment. Now, if you sit there and you look at the 10 payment row, notice in the 10 payment row where we were looking, all of those numbers are less than 10 because what? It has to be less than the total number of payments to get present value, doesn't it? Okay. So if you're ever confused, what table am I supposed to be on? You can use that as your rule to help guide you, right? Okay. Just don't look at that first year on the first payment on the annuity table. Okay, so we figured out the present value of that bond. It was less than face, wasn't it? Okay, and when we recorded that in our financial statements, we debited the cash for the amount of cash we got. We credited the bond payable for the face. We had to make that journal entry balance. We debited the discount for 73605 When we prepared our financial statements, we did what? Bond payable was a million. Discount is a contra to the bond payable. The carrying value of this bond is 926395 right? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at this next situation and it's still our same bond. It's still the million dollar bond is the face. What's the coupon rate? 10, no. Coupon rate is 10%. That doesn't change. 10% divided by 2, right, is going to be what? Or times 1 half, whatever, is going to be 50,000. Will the 50,000 ever change? 50,000 is like your best friend, isn't it? 
What do you say to your best friend? Promise me you'll never change. Your friend says, okay, I won't change. So the 50000 is the same every six months, right? And then what happens? The million dollars comes back at the end, doesn't it? So that's all the same. So what's different here now is that the market rate is 8%. Market rate is 8%. It is less than the contract stated coupon rate. Those terms are all synonymous. And so we know going in that this bond's going to issue for what? More than face, right? Higher than face? More than face? So let's just go ahead. Let's do the mechanics. And again, it is now 8%. Notice when we look for the factor to discount, we take the market rate of interest, right? 8% divided by 2 equals 4%. And it's how many period? How many payments? Ten payments. Good. Okay. So we come over and we can see that we're going to look for the factor associated with what? Four percent for ten periods. That's for the principal. I'll just write print in there. Principal. And for the interest, I'll just abbreviate that int. Okay. Interest. It's four percent for ten periods, right? Okay, we got those off the respective tables, and we'll look here in a second at those. But let's just go ahead. There's my interest times that factor, 8.11090. Then what? There's the present value dollar, uh, present value of a dollar factor for my principal. My principal is a million. I'm just writing in the multiplication. I think it would have been a better presentation if they had done that. So a million times that present value of the dollar factor. That gives me the present value of my principal present value of my interest. I add those two together and this bond is indeed going to sell for more than face. It's going to sell for what? 1,081,105. Adding the present value of the principal, the present value of the interest together. The bond indeed did issue for more than face. Now we've proven that, right? Okay. Now you go ahead and you notice the same journal entry here, but now now we're going ahead and we're doing what? We're debiting the cash for $1,081,105. You will always credit the bond payable for the face of the bond, the full million. Okay? And then what? Then you're going to go ahead and you're going to sit here and you're going to credit the premium on the bond payable for $81,105. Does this journal entry balance now? Okay? Now when you set up the balance sheet, you're going to have what? You're going to sit here and have bond payable for how much? Don't use your imagination. One million. You're going to have a premium here now. How much is the premium? 81,105. And so you're going to come up here with what? Now the carrying value. Of the bond is what? is more than face, isn't it? It's going to be 1,081,105. Now, I don't have a name for an account that increases the value. They don't have a name for it. Like we have contra asset, contra liability, which reduces it, is opposite. This one's the same direction, isn't it? But I don't have a word for it. Okay, so it does increase. The premium increases the carrying value. Okay, question? Well, because they're making an investment, uh, and it depends on what they need this money for. So let's say you're looking at a house, and the house costs a million dollars, and you figure you can wait five years for the house, or the house costs, excuse me, the house costs one million eighty-one thousand one hundred five, or whatever. The house costs one million five hundred and eighty-one thousand one hundred five, and you can wait five years. You'd give the dude your million bucks, and at the end of five years, do you have the money you needed? Huh? So it's an investment, right? And you get the return on investment that meets whatever it is your needs are. Okay? Uh, and you would be getting 50000 every um, every six months on this that you could also save and et cetera. So it's just what you're trying to accomplish as an investor. Okay? The corporation is going to do what? 
they're going to take this million eighty one thousand one hundred five, and presumably they have a five year project. So what a corporation would do is they would sit there and they would try to match the term of the bond with whatever's going on with their project, right? Okay. Now, if you're the federal government, do you do that? Do you match your borrowing with the term of any kind of project or anything like that? If you're the federal government? If you're the federal government, you just borrow more than you take in every year, don't you? Okay, and I did that thing in here before. One day you wake up and how much do you owe? 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What's that number? That's the what? 20 trillion. Yes, that's the public debt, right? Okay. Now, they want to try and blame all of this on Obama, okay? But uh, what they don't talk to you about is when Obama got in, there was already what? 10 trillion sitting there. And so I'm going to blame that on Bush, too, okay? And when Bush, too, got in, there was already. Five trillion sitting there, so we'll put that on Clinton. I used to have to say Clinton one. Will there be a two? I guess not. Okay. <laughs> so I'll put that on Clinton. And when Clinton got in, there was already what? 1.5 trillion on there, so we'll blame that on Father Bush. Okay, Bush one. Okay, and so they all take their turn, don't they? Okay, and they keep mushrooming this thing up. Now, you sit there and you hear Trump saying, oh, that number 20 trillion is horrible. Well, look, if he's going to do all the things that he's talking about doing, I'm going to cut taxes, I'm going to rebuild the infrastructure, and I'm not going to throw anybody off of, you know, Social Security, then that's the number that it's going to be when he gets out, if not more. Okay, so they all take their turn, right? Okay, so they don't sit there and try and match the debt with some project. They just keep issuing debt on top of debt, right? Okay, now you come over, and um, that's why the investor would do that, because uh, they want to get the return, right? Now you come over, and you take a look at the, um, oh, no, we want to go back to the tables. Let's just sort of uh, confirm the numbers off the table here. So it was the next time, the next one was 8%. Times, do you want me to do the table or do you just want me to skip the table? Why, why should you use the 8%? Why does the market rate not the bond rate? Because we discounted the market rate of interest. Them's the rules. You don't use the coupon rate. If you use the coupon rate, it's going to come right out to face to a million. To determine what we want to pay, we have to use the market rate, and that discount or that premium is compensating us. I probably should have mentioned that a little bit better. Let's look back for a second. When we go ahead and we get this 926, 395, how much are we going to have to pay the guy when the thing matures? We're paying the 50,000 every six months, and when the thing matures, how much are we going to have to pay him? The full 1 million. So we're going to have to pay the dude an extra 73,605, aren't we? That 73,605 is catching the guy up for all that time that our stupid bond was paying 10% when the market wanted what? 12%, right? So if you discount at the coupon rate, it'll come out exactly to 100,000. When you discount at the market rate, then it's going to come out less, and you're going to have to pay the guy back a little bit more, or the full amount at the end, that little extra 73,605, catches him up finally at the end, doesn't it? Say that again? Yeah, so what I'm saying is, um, why would I, if it's going to come out the same, why would I not just put it in the market? Um, the the 100,000, you mean? What do you mean? If, if, if the coupon rate equaled the... the, the well, because we're discounting and putting premiums on whatever our base is based on the market, I feel like we basically put the same amount of money, whether we put it in the market or we buy um, Okay, I'm not, we're not measuring alternative investments here, okay? We're assuming that somebody decided to buy this bond, making this decision that they're going to get a 12% return. The way they're getting the 12% return is by giving the person 926395 That 12% return consists of 50000 every six months, which is basically a 10% return. 
And if you just got your million back at the end, that would then just be a 10% return. Because you're going to sit there and you only gave up 926, 395, and you get a full million back, that extra 73,605 is what brings it up to the market rate of interest at 12%. Right? It's increasing the return. What market? You just did. You bought a bond at market for nine hundred and twenty-six thousand three ninety-five, and if you get fifty thousand every six months for the next five years, and you get a million back at the end of the bond, you just made twelve percent return. The same as what? I don't understand. The same as what? This, no, you asked the question, you never mind. The same as what? <laughs> Whether I'm investing in Christie Corporation or the market. Yes, they're investing in Christie Corporation who is floating bonds on the market. Christie Corporation is a corporation that needs money. They go to an underwriter and they say, will you please help me take my bonds to market? The underwriter does, and the underwriter takes those bonds to market. The market wants a 12% return, so they're only able to issue that bond for 926395 Then the investor will get the 50000 every six months. They'll get the full million back at the end. That extra 73605 brings them up to a 12% return. Christie Corporation is issuing these bonds on the market. Okay. Okay. Now you come over and we have what? We have this 73,605 brings our return up to 12%. Now here with this one, we had the 1,081,105. So how much are we going to pay the guy back? How much do we pay the guy back? We just pay him back a million dollars, don't we? So we're going to get to do what? We're going to get to keep that extra 81,105, aren't we? That's catching us up for the time, all that time that our bond was paying 10% when the market was only requiring what? An 8% return, right? And that catches us up at that point when we get that full 1 million, when we only have to pay back a million and we get to keep that 81,105. Okay? Question? Peter? Okay. All right. So we come over now and we're going to go through the mechanics of the accounting here. Okay. So let's first look at this discount bond. And when we look at this discount, is this a discount bond? Yeah. We'll first look at the discount bond. And when we look at it, we issued it for 926, 395. So there is a discount of 73,605 on this bond, isn't there? We take that 73,605, we divide that by. 10 and using straight line amortization now we will amortize seven thousand three hundred and sixty dollars and fifty cents of that premium uh, excuse me discount off that bond every what every six months ten six month periods right okay so we go ahead and we take that discount amortization we add it to the cash interest what's your buddy's name What's your buddy's name? Bob? No, your buddy's name is 50,000. You're going to go ahead and you're going to pay that 50,000 every six months, aren't you? Okay. But to get my interest expense, my interest expense is what? Interest expense is the 50,000 plus the amortization of the discount because I am going to have to cough up that extra 73,605. So my interest isn't just what? 50,000. It's a little more than 50,000 every period as I grow closer and closer to the day that when I pay the guy, I got to pay him the full million dollars. I'm going to pay him an extra 73,605. So my interest isn't just 50,000. It's 50,000 plus the amortization of the premium, right? Okay. Now I go ahead and I continue on and I go ahead and I do what? I make this uh, journal entry, of course, when I issued the bond. And then when I make that first interest payment, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, of course, debit the bond interest expense. Is it an expense? 
So I want to debit it. I'll credit the cash for the 50,000 because I'm just paying the guys 50,000, right? And I will go ahead and I'll credit the discount on bond payable $7,360. Now, just to sort of tee this up on the side here for a second. Oops. Just to tee this up, we've got the discount. And when we first, is there a question? When we first got the bond, we did what? We debited the discount 73,605. So what's the balance? Guys, do you just want to go home and figure it out on your own, or what's the deal? Yeah? Huh? Yes? No? Okay. So what's the balance here? 73,605. Oops. 605. Okay. And then what? Then we go ahead and when we amortize that discount and we make that cash payment and recognize our interest expense, we debit the discount, don't we? I mean, excuse me, uh, credit the discount? 736050. 736050. Uh, okay, no, that's right, it's still there. 736050. And when we do now, the balance here comes to what? 73,605 minus now um, 73,650. I'm waiting. 73,605. We debited originally. Now we're crediting it seven thousand three hundred sixty dollars and fifty cents. Six six two four four fifty. Thank you. Six six two four four fifty. Six six two four four fifty. Okay. So when we prepare the balance sheet now, how much is my bond payable? Don't use your imagination. Bond payable is still a million dollars I credited the bond payable nothing's changed right so bond payable is still a million how much is the discount now six six two four four fifty so if you take the six six two four four fifty minus the million what's the carrying value of the bond now something like nine three three Seven five five fifty. Huh? Yep. Seven five five fifty. Okay. All right. So what happened? The seven three three uh, nine three three. Excuse me. Seven five five fifty. The bonds carrying value came up by the amount of discount amortization, didn't it? And it makes sense that it comes up by the amount of discount amortization because the discount was a contra against the bond payable by debiting the bond payable. Now, by crediting the bond payable, now I did what? I made it less by crediting the what? Discount. I made the discount less. If the discount is less, the subtract off the bond payable is less. The carrying value has to do what? Has to go up, doesn't it? Simple mathematics, guys. If you make the number that you're subtracting from another number smaller, the difference gets bigger, doesn't it? Okay. And so the carrying value of that bond is going to do what? It's going to go up period after period as I discount, as I amortize that discount. Every period I'll do the same thing. The difference between what? The amount of the, the discount amortization, I should say, and plus the cash interest will what? Will always give you my interest expense, and the amount of the discount amortization will reduce the discount. Carrying value of the bond will go up by the amount of the discount amortization, right? Until finally, in that last period, the bond payable is showing at face, isn't it? And what am I going to pay the guy back? going to pay the guy back the full million, right? So at that point, the discount is fully amortized. We liquidate the bond payable, debit bond payable, credit the cash. This thing is fully accounted for, isn't it? Okay. 
Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at this example now, which is the premium. The premium bond, it was what? 81,105. We divide it by the 10 periods. That gives me $8,110.50. Okay. Then what? Then I go ahead and I have my, what's my buddy's name? 50,000 that will not change but what happens I sit here and I subtract the amount of premium amortization that lowers my interest expense below the 50,000 and it should lower my interest expense below the 50,000 because I'm going to get to keep that extra 81,105 in my pocket right at the end I'm going to only pay the guy back a million so indeed my interest expense is being lowered below that 50,000 right Okay, so when you look at the accounting for that, we go ahead, we debit the cash, one million eighty-one thousand. We credit the premium, we credit the bond payable. That was that same entry that we saw for the issuance of the premium bond. Now I'm going to tee up the premium over here. Okay, when I tee up the premium, just abbreviating that premium, when I tee uh, up the premium, I credit it for eighty-one thousand one hundred five on issue, don't I? That's that credit right there. Okay, and then what? The balance is that amount, $1,081,105. Then I go ahead and I make that first interest payment. Of course, I go ahead and I credit the cash for my buddy $50,000. I debit the interest expense for this $41,899,889.50, which was what? The $50,000 minus the amortization of the premium. And then I go ahead and I debit the premium to make that journal entry balance, $8,011050. And when I do, now the premium balance comes to 72,000, what, uh, 99450? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 72,99450 is what the premium has in it now. So when I prepare the balance sheet, don't use your imagination. Bond payable is how much? Million dollars. And then my premium has how much? Don't use your imagination. Huh? 72,944450. Okay. And so I go ahead and the premium of course adds to the carrying value, right? And so it's 1,072,94450 becomes the carrying amount of the bond now because we made the premium what? Less. So if a number that you're adding becomes less, then the total is less, isn't it? Than it was before we amortized that premium okay and so if you notice the carrying value of this bond does what it comes down every six months as we get closer and closer to the day when we'll pay what the million dollars right uh, what does carrying, value mean? carrying value means how much it's being reported on the financial statements at the net carrying value you could call it net carrying value so it's basically the bond payable plus the premium or Minus the discount. It so depends the on the thing. The price on the market of this bond was one million eighty one thousand one oh five when we bought it. Now this bond may fluctuate on the market to other people that are buying it at other dates as interest rates change and of course their cash flows will change because there's a different time horizon now associated with that. So this bond may fluctuate on the market. All we're talking about is the um, this from the standpoint of the issuer, the uh, issue price, and then the carrying value of the bond as we go every six months. And as long as the entity has the positive intent and ability to hold this to maturity, they do not have to make uh, changes to the carrying value of the bond for changes in the market if they intend to hold it to maturity. And we're going to assume in this class they do. Okay? We're talking accounting here, guys. We're not talking finance. Okay? Okay, good. Now we come over and uh, we deal with that straight line. And uh, that's the easy way of doing things. Straight line. Okay. Now, what. Uh, I will talk about the investor after we do the effective rate. Okay, I promise I'll talk about it. Okay, I'll do the investor.
Well, the investor is making money. I mean, they're making money for the interest revenue, aren't they? I mean, they're getting interest revenue. Now, like I said, if the interest rates are fluctuating, if you paid what? You paid, your, you know, paid an amount for a 12% bond, and now all of a sudden bonds of similar risk, et cetera, are paying a lot more interest, then you made not the best decision in the world in that investment, right? But you're still having revenue. Your revenue is what? Your revenue is the other guy's interest expense, isn't it? Okay, and when you set up that bond payable, you, I mean not bond payable, the investment in the bonds, you went ahead and you debited investment in bonds, you credited the cash, right? That's when you made the investment. And then when you go ahead and you start to get your $50,000 payments, you'll go ahead and you'll debit the cash for $50,000 and you are going to credit the bond investment. That brings down the carrying value of the bond investment and it should bring it down because when that thing matures, you're only going to get what? the face, right? The million dollars on the bond. So you'll credit the investment to bring down the carrying amount of the investment and your interest revenue is going to be the difference between the cash interest you got and the decrease in the carrying value of the investment. So you're having interest revenue. Okay, now whether or not you're experiencing, you know, a positive, you know, gain because you're having that bond increase in its market value is not what we're talking about here. That's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. And again, we would need to look at this investment. And if it was a trading security that we were trading on the market on a daily basis, we would have to mark the security to market. We'd have to mark it to market each period. And if it was a trading security, unrealized holding gains and losses would go to the income statement. If it was available for sales security, then we would have to market to market each period and unrealizing holding gains and losses would go to something called comprehensive income, which is our net income plus our other comprehensive income. Our other comprehensive income consists of pension adjustments, our unrealizing holding gains on available for sales securities, effective for portion of a cash flow hedge, uh, foreign currency uh, translation, um, gain or loss and for IFRS we have would have a revaluation surplus amount that would be making up our other comprehensive income so we would take our comprehensive income plus our other comprehensive income that gives us comprehensive income that we would have to report if it is a held to maturity security we don't consider unrealized holding gains and losses and so this could very well be a um, a uh, held to maturity security because they're carrying that investment at amortized cost. What did they pay for it? The million dollars less the amount of the premium that's been amortized. So right now that investment is going to be what is going to be the one million eighty one thousand minus the eight thousand one hundred and ten fifty. It's at amortized cost. We're carrying that investment at one million seventy two thousand nine hundred forty four dollars and fifty cents. Right. That's all I got for you on how we would calculate gains and losses on this bond if we were the investor. Okay. Okay. So we come over and we're sitting here and we are going to be uh, worrying about the, the um, now the borrower in this case. And now we're going to talk about something called the effective interest method. Okay, when we talk about the effective interest method, we're going to um, be calculating our interest in a manner that FASB would prefer that we use. In fact, FASB requires that we use the effective interest method. However, they tell us that we can use straight line if it's not materially different from the effective method, which I find annoying because that would mean that I'd have to first use straight line to see if it was different than effective. And by the time I get doing that, I might as well have used effective, right? Okay. Now, how do we do the effective interest? Well, remember we issued that bond for 1,081,105, the one we were just looking at? We would take that 1,081,105 and we would multiply that times 4%. And when we multiply that times 4%, that's what? Where are we getting the 4%? 8% what? Divided by 2, right? We multiply that by the market rate of interest. The market rate of interest. That gives me the effective interest here of what? 43,244. What's my buddy's name? 
50,000, I compare that to the cash, that difference is the amount of my premium amortization. So now instead of slicing it up evenly over each period, I'm amortizing it by taking what? The carrying value of the bond and multiplying that times the market rate of interest, right? So I go ahead and I do what? I would make that same journal entry, guys. Let's just do the journal entry. I'm going to debit interest expense for how much? Huh? You know, my interest expense is what? 43,244. Good. I'm going to credit cash for what? Credit cash for my buddy. 50,000. That's not going to change, right? Oh, there's the journal entry on the next page. Great. That's all right. Credit the cash for 50,000 because I'm paying the cash out, right? Do I need a debit or credit to make this journal entry balance? I need a debit. That debit is going to be to what? Premium, and it's going to be to premium for 6756. Okay, does that make the premium less? Does that debit make the premium less? When I issued the bond, I credited the premium for 81,105. Now I just debited it. It'll make the premium less, right? Okay, the premium will now be 74349. And how do I know that? Because I look over and notice that what? That becomes a new carrying amount of the bond. Okay, so if you're on the exam, guys, and I ask you what is the carrying value of the bond after the premium amortization, it should be the easiest thing in the world for you, which would be to do what? Figure out the amount of premium amortization and subtract that from the previous carrying value. That gives you the new carrying value, doesn't it? Okay, so you'd go through. Do I have a new carrying value now? Do I have a new carrying value now? Did I uh, amortize that premium? So I go ahead and I multiply that by 4%. That gives me the interest expense for the next six months, doesn't it? Okay. I compare that to, what's my buddy's name? 50000 That gives me the premium amortization for the second six months. What do I do? I take that premium amortization, and since the premium amortization is going to reduce the premium, I reduce the premium, the carrying value of the bond goes down, doesn't it? So all I have to do is take that premium amortization, subtract it from the previous carrying value. That gives me the new carrying value. I guess I could have done it right there, right? Subtract it from the previous carrying value. That gives me the new carrying value. I take that new carrying value. I bring that over. I multiply that times 4% for the next six months. If I go through the whole table, you'll go into a coma, right? You will be able to do this, right, on your exam? Do I see free response question possibly coming? Okay. Okay, good. And I'm not going to make you do 10 periods, guys. You know, I might have you do two or three or something. Okay. Question. Okay, good. Now, if we're talking about what the journal entries here, and I think I showed you one of them already, but here we go. We're going to do what? Debit the cash, credit the premium. Credit the bond payable for the million dollars when we issue the bond. Then what? Then we go ahead and we take that first six months. So we debit the bond interest expense that we calculated by taking the carrying value of the bond times the market rate of interest of 4%. That gave me the interest expense. What's my buddy's name? 50000 I credit the cash. The difference between the cash and the amount of the interest expense that I calculated by multiplying 4% times the carrying value of the bond each period is going to be the amortization of the premium. Since I credited the premium when I got the bond, I will do what? I will debit the premium as I record my interest each period, right? And you do the same thing every six months. Aren't you glad you became a CPA? What do you do after this? No, you go home to your very nice house. You guys are never going to, at some point, you have to get that right. You sit there and you work with this, and when you're done, you get in your very nice car and you go home to your very nice house, right? Okay. Okay, good. Any question? Notice, uh huh? Which is what we just talked about. Right. Um, no, this is more accurate. Effective interest method is more precise, okay? Because all the 
um, all the straight line method was doing was coming and saying, okay, take the discount, take the premium, divide it by 10. That's not recognizing the mathematics of finance. That is disrespecting those tables that we looked at at the very beginning because those tables were saying no. As the carrying amount of a liability goes up, the amount of interest you owe on that goes up as well, right? And the what? And, and you can see, well, actually, this is a, uh, this is the opposite. As the carrying value of the bond went down, notice the interest expense went down, doesn't it? And it should go down each period because I'm owing less and less each period as we come closer and closer to the day when that bond owes a only a million dollars on that. So that's actually an excellent question. Okay. Now, if it is what? If it is a, uh, that one's a little tougher to see. If it is a, let's see if I can do this. No. I forgot, I have to do it like with the Kung Fu grip. No? No? There's a certain way to do it to make it larger, but forget it. I see my Kung Fu grip is not any good anymore. So what happens? You guys don't know what the Kung Fu grip is? No. They used to have this uh, doll that you could get when I was a kid. It was like, you know, like a... Ken doll or something. You guys know what a Ken doll is, right? And but it was like this warrior, and he had the kung fu grip. And there's a certain way of doing this, but I can't seem to make it work. But you can see this pretty good. 926,395 is what we issued the bond for, right? The market rate of interest was what? 12% divided by two. So we used what? 6% on that. Good. So we take the 926,395 times what? 6%, that gives me my interest for the first six months, right? What's my buddy's name? 50000 So I pay that 50000 cash. The difference between the effective interest and the amount of cash is going to give me the discount amortization, isn't it? This 5585. Okay. Now what happens? Since the discount amortization, when I issued the bond, I debited the discount. Now I'm going to do what? credit the discount so it brings down the carrying amount of the bond doesn't it and so the carrying amount of the bond goes from not down it brings what up the carrying amount of the bond because the bond was sitting there at what at this 926,395 right 395 was the carrying value right there it was the million dollars let's rewrite it here a million dollars minus what Minus the 73,605. That's what gave us the 926,395. Okay, and when I issued that bond, I went ahead and I debited the discount. Now I debited my interest expense for my interest ex effective interest, which was the 6% times the 926,395. I credit my cash for 50. I need a credit to make this journal entry balance. So I credit the discount. That does what? That brings down the discount, which does what? Brings up the carrying value of the bond, right? Discount comes up, the discount comes down, the carrying value comes up. So to come up with the new carrying value, you simply do what? Take that previous carrying value and add it to the amount of your discount amortization. That gives you the new carrying amount, doesn't it? Okay, I'm just showing you a shorter way to do this. The premium, you did what? The premium, you sat there and you subtracted the amount of premium amortization. For the discount, you add the amount of discount amortization to get that new carrying value, right? Okay. And so you go ahead and you do that. You bring over that new carrying value. You multiply that times 6%. That gives you the interest expense for the next six months, right? You have that interest expense for the next six months. What's my buddy's name? 50000 That difference is my... Discount amortization brings the discount down. Discount goes down. Carrying amount of the bond goes up, doesn't it? By the amount of the discount amortization. So there's the carrying value now for that uh, next six-month period. I bring that over. I multiply that times 6%. I'm not going to go through the whole table, right? Okay. Question. Okay, I'll tell you what. Let's take five before we die and uh, we'll come back and we'll go through the quiz questions for chapter 10 okay yeah sure 
Face value bond is the face value. Well, I mean, I mean the price of the bond. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, this is how like, I really know how to do it. And, like, I, I, I did it with all, like, plugging all the numbers and stuff in the formula. Like, this is 100 right here, but it should just be like the, the face value if I just put 100. But, um, uh huh. And I'm just asking, like, if like, on the exam, if I, for some reason, like, use this method as opposed to yours, which, like, this comes out with, like, the exact, as opposed to, like, what we do, I think, like, the, the rounding, like, over time, mm -hmm. doesn't come exactly right. I was wondering if, if that would be like a problem if I use if I use this method. If you get the right answer, it won't be a problem. But like, if, but like based on, I mean, like for example, I did like the calculation. I got like one million eighty four. Like, and like it was just like off by like a couple like. Yeah. Like, the, the ones, but it's, it okay. Exactly okay. So there's probably some rounding in there. Who yeah. knows what in that example? Okay. Yeah. If you get the right answer, it doesn't matter how you do it. You know, um, but you're, I recommend that you learn how to do it the way we're doing it here, even if you think you get a right or answer that way, because I can't write a test for, you know, 40 different students. So we're going to be doing it this way. And so I'll be, you'll see, I'll give you the present value factors and stuff, and you got to use those present value factors. I think it's going to be the better way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be endlessly off. You can get in the ballpark with it if you got if you got messed up, but I really think you're going to be spending a lot more time doing that than doing it the way I'm going to show you in these problems in a minute. Okay. Okay, so you get this 8%. You divide it by what? 2. That equals 4%, and it is what? It is a five-year bond, so how many payments? 10 payments, right? Okay, good. And the question tells me what is the issue price for this bond? And they give me some factors. One is it 4% for 10 periods? One is it 5% for 10 periods? What should I use? I should use the 4% factors for 10 periods. In fact, I think I even recognized those from our little problem earlier, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead. And highlight those and I have present value of a dollar present value of an annuity right what should I use for the principal present value of a dollar I'm going to take the six hundred thousand times what point six seven five five six anybody got a number for me here Six hundred thousand times point six six four hundred five thousand three 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 six. Okay, everybody's on with that one. Okay, good. Then I have to what? I have to come up with the interest, don't I? So who wants to help me get the interest? Present value for the interest. Well, let's get the interest payment. What's the interest payment? Tell me how. Six hundred thousand times point one, the ten percent, right? Good, very good. Or I'll say times one half, whatever. Okay, same thing. And you got what? Thirty thousand. Yeah. Okay, good. So you take that thirty thousand, and what do you want to do with that thirty thousand? Good, right? The four percent one. 8.11090 and what do you get? Two four Like that? Okay. You add those two numbers together. What do you get? Six four eight six six three. 
right? Okay, so this bond did what? It sold for more than face, and it should sell for more than face because what? The bond was paying 10% where the market was only paying 8, right? Okay, good. Now, this is one of those questions, and all this is a trick question. What is the carrying value of the bond at January 1st? Carrying value of the bond, let's just put it in terms of how to look on the financial statement. And I'm always like, this is not a trick question. This is the easiest question in the world. It's bond payable of how much? Bond payable, 600000 The premium is what? Forty-eight thousand six six three, and so the carrying value of the bond then is going to be six forty-eight six six three. The same answer, right? And I get people that miss that question, and I'm like, okay, you know, I thought that was a gimme. The carrying value is exactly what you issued it for after the bond has been issued, right? Right? Okay. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. 8% is the market. Market for similar bonds is 8%. You use the market rate to, for your factors. You use the what? The stated rate, the coupon rate to calculate your interest payments, right? And then you discount everything using the factors at the market rate. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead then, and I say, what is the interest expense for the first six months? And I probably should have called out here that we're going to use the effective interest method. Who wants to set that up? Who wants to set that up? You want to try it, Grace? Huh? No? You can do the next one. Peter, you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a reason I'm not writing it. Uh, not 48, what? 648, the whole carrying amount of the bond, right? How much did I borrow? How much money did I borrow here? What's the journal entry for the issuance? Somebody was willing to pay me 648,663 for this bond, weren't they? So that means I debited cash for 648,663. I credited bond payable for how much? 600,000 and I credited the premium for what? 48,663, right? Now what happens? If the next day I decide, oh, I, I, I don't want to borrow this money anymore. What's the guy going to say to me? Okay, then give me 648,663 back, dude. You know, I'm not going to just be able to have him 600,000 if I haven't paid him any interest of 30,000 every six months or anything. He wants his money back, right? So immediately after issue, how much have I borrowed? How much have I borrowed? The amount of money that's in my pocket, 648,663, right? So for that first six months, isn't that what I owe the dude? For the first six months, so 648663 times what's the interest rate? Huh? The interest rate is 4%, 0 0.04, right? I take that 648663 times 4%, does that give me 25,947 or somewhere in that vicinity? That's my interest for the first six months? Right? Okay. What is the carrying value of the bond at June 30th, year one? Now, what's going to happen? I'm going to show you the long way to calculate it. I'm going to show you the quick, easy way to calculate it, right? Long way to calculate the carrying value would be to do what? To look at that premium when I first issued the bond, the premium was what? 
48663. That was the balance in the premium account. And then when I went ahead and I paid my interest, I went ahead and – oh, stop. <sighs> I went ahead and I would have done what? I would have credited cash for how much? My buddy's name has changed now. It's what? 30000 is what I pay every six months, right? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to debit my what? My interest expense. And since this was a premium bond, what's going to happen? My interest expense will be reduced. Well, I know. I don't have to sit there and figure out that it will be reduced below the, the tw uh, uh, 30000 I know that my interest expense is... 25,947 because I just calculated it up there, didn't I? Didn't I just calculate that? And so do I need a debit or a credit to make this journal entry balance? A debit, and I need a debit of oboes, please. 4,000 what? Huh? 4,053? Okay, so that goes as a debit to the premium, doesn't it? So that's a debit to the premium for 4053 So now the premium balance is how much? 48663 minus 454053? 44610. Yeah, 44610 like that. Okay, good. So I have what? I have bond payable of a million. I have premium now of 44610 Oh, sorry. 600000 Sorry. It was back to my million-dollar bond there for a second. 600000 I have premium of 44610 and so how much is the carrying value of the bond now? 644610 because I add the premium, don't I? So I don't know why I put the premium in parentheses because it's not being subtracted. It's being added. The premium gets added. Premium gets added. 44610. Premium gets added, right? Gets added. Okay. Now, as I said, that's the long, hard road <laughs> towards getting that right answer. The easy way to do it would have been to do what? Take the 648663, and since it's premium amortization, we do what? We subtract the amount of premium amortization from that previous carrying value. And when you do, you simply subtract that 4. Zero five three, and of course you get the same answer, don't you? Six four four six ten. Okay. Okay, good. So there was that one. What is the interest expense for the next six months? Who wants to set that up? Paul, you guys. I promised you the next one. Good. Point zero four is the market rate of interest, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Do you get twenty five thousand seven eighty four? Yeah. Nice work. Okay. So I mean, this was one of those problems that you know, if you knew what you were doing, you were like, yes, this is a piece of cake, right? If you you know didn't get it, then you were in, you were in big trouble. Okay, then what? Then I went ahead and I, the first one was so wonderful, we did a second one. Okay, and this is a second bond now. And now the what? The only thing that's changed is the market rate of interest is now 12%, isn't it? Okay, so you take that 12% and you divide that by 2. That gives you what? 6%. And so you go ahead and we have what? Five years. So it's how many payments? 10 payments. There's my factors, right? 
So who wants to set up my factor for my principal? Who wants to set me up for the principal calculation? Uh, Jordy, you want to do it? Mm -hmm. And we get three three five zero three four. Okay, good. How about the? Uh, you want to do the, the? Go ahead and do the. Uh, do the interest, Jordy. Six hundred thousand times what? Times point one times one half, right? The way we just this, the way we did before. So it's still thirty thousand, isn't it? Okay. And then how do you want to get the present value of that? Seven point two three four. And that gives me. Two hundred twenty thousand eight hundred two. You say? Okay. Okay. Good. I add those two together, and that should give me five 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 eight three seven. This one right here. The I'm, it's not the amount of money I'm getting. I'm paying because I'm doing the calculation for the person who's borrowing, right? I'm paying this interest, right? Okay. okay. But yeah, it's 600,000 times 0.1 times 1 half, 30,000 every six months. That's what I pay every six months for the entire term of this bond, right? No matter what happens. Okay. Okay, good. So did we get the same answer? 555837? Five, 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 okay. Okay, good. How about now the carrying value of the bond immediately after issue? It's exactly what I paid for it, isn't it? It's the face of the bond plus the premium. Is there a question? Okay. Okay, point seven. Close enough, yeah. I would never. If you, if you get a question, guys, that the rounding is, you know, not perfect, notice that none of these other answers have a chance of being as close as this one, right? So you got to go with the best one if you're a few cents off. Okay. Okay, good. So then what happens? Then I come over and I want to know the interest expense for the first six months. Who wants to set that one up? Uh -huh. Five 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 eight three seven. You say? Yeah. Times. Now it's six percent. Four percent was the previous problem. Now it's the four. Now it's the market rate. Twelve percent divided by two, right? Yeah. And so that gives me hopefully thirty-three thousand three fifty. Thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. Very good. What's? Uh huh. I didn't. I used the market rate to calculate the interest in both of them. I, huh? I did. I did the same thing each time for each problem. The amount of cash interest is the six hundred thousand times the ten percent divided by two times one half. It's thirty thousand every six months. No matter what happens to the market rate, it's 30,000, 30,000, right? Just like in the problem set we went through, it was 50,000. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm just confused on, like, I, I'm just comparing the two different uh, interest rate, uh, rates we use. Like, I'm just confused on what the 
I use 0 0.10 to calculate the cash interest that's going to be paid every six months, right? Yeah. So that's 600,000 times 0 0.10 times one half. That's 30,000, right? Yeah. Then when I go and I get the present value of those, I use the market rate to discount those. Okay. If I use the stated rate to discount those, it'll be, I don't, you know, I'm wasting my time. The present value of all that's going to be 600,000. But if I use the market rate and the market rate is what? More, it'll be less than 600,000. If the market rate is less, it'll be more than 600,000. Right. Okay. Which is what the case was, right? Notice it came out to this 555837 and the other one was 648, whatever. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, I say, what is the carrying value of the bond now? Somebody do it for me the easy way. What was the previous carrying value? Previous carrying value was what? 555837. Five, if I've reduced the discount and the discount is subtracting from the bond, then the carrying value of the bond has to go what? Has to go up, doesn't it? And you know it has to go up because the bond's got to get to 600000 doesn't it? Because at the end of this term, I have to pay the full 600000 So you look at these choices. Can it be that the um, carrying value can still be 555837? No, I know it has to do what? Has to go up, right? Can it be 560? Yeah, I guess it could. Could it be 561? I thought in this question I took pity and made them all, um, made them all lower amounts. But I didn't. I guess that wasn't the clip test where I did that. Okay. So it's going to have to calculate to figure out what that higher amount is going to be. Okay. Is it? Kind of following up on Paul's question with like when do you use the like 10% versus the 12%? Well, uh -huh. this, you said like it's like the interest expense. So. <laughs> what is all this? My computer is being taken over by wizards. Um, Right. No, no, no. No, it was 8% and it was 12%. To get the interest expense, I multiply it times the market rate of interest, 8% divided by 2. That gives me the interest expense, right? To figure out the cash, I multiply it times the stated coupon rate which in this case is 0 0.05, right, okay? So you want to get used to that. That gets a little confusing. To get the cash, it's the stated rate times the, um, basically the face of the bond, right? To get the interest expense, it's the market rate times the carrying value of the bond. What's the reason for that? Because you're paying the market value for that? Yes. Yeah, I'm paying market rate. Remember, guys, when we calculate the bond, go back to the example bond here. The, the problem, we forget this one, do the one we were looking at in the slides. Remember, that bond was what? $1 million, but I issued it for $926,395. I got to pay the dude back full million. I got to cough up an extra $73,605. In straight line, we just divided that evenly. In effective interest method, you're doing that by what? You're now using the mathematics of finance to do that by taking that 926,395 and multiplying it by the market rate, of course, semi-annual market rate. And that's how you end up amortizing that bond. And by the mathematics of finance, it's kind of like doing that present value table in reverse. You're unraveling that present value table to bring it back down now to the million dollars as you do that every semi-annual period, 10 periods, whatever it is. Okay? Okay, good. So, uh, were you guys stalling? You Nobody wants to give me the... Uh, uh, not that, you know, if you want to, you can give me the journal entry for this. This problem was just asking for the number, Carl, but if you want to give me the journal entry, you can. Uh, journal entry, I have debit. Good. Debit, interest, expense, Three three five zero, you say? Yes. Okay, go ahead. 
Good. Credit your buddy Cash for thirty thousand. Excellent. Excellent. Discount gets credited three three five zero. The difference, right? Okay. Good. So I take the what? I take the previous carrying value of five five five. Eight three seven, and I'm going to add how much to that? Three three five zero. Three, three, five, zero you say? Yeah. And when you add that together, you get five five nine one eight seven, right? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Everybody found their study partner, right? Okay. Very good. Because you even gave me the journal entry on that, right? So you crushed that whole transaction. Okay, good. Um, what is the interest expense for the second year? Go ahead, do it for me. Interest expense for the second year. you do because you very good because you have to use the market rate of interest right okay beautiful and you get something like that that ballpark Paul? the coupon the coupon rate stated rate or contract rate you need to know those terms coupon rate stated rate contract rate are all synonymous terms that's the amount that's on the face of the bond right To calculate what you pay every six months, you only really need to make that calculation once, right? Oh, yeah. Whatever it is, fifty thousand, thirty thousand, and once you know what it is, those the cash flows that you use to come up with the present value, and the difference between that thirty thousand, fifty thousand, and the interest expense that you get by taking the carrying value of the bond times the uh, market rate of interest, our six percent, our four percent. That difference will be the amortization, the discount, or premium the difference between that thirty thousand, fifty thousand, whatever. Okay. If you if you wanted to do this again. If you want to do the carrying value, you want to keep going with this, okay? So we'd have the what? We'd have the five five nine five five nine John one eight seven, and then and then we're going to go ahead and add to that now the difference between three three five five one and what? What's your buddy's name? Thirty thousand. Good. And that gives me what uh, three five five one, and then you take that three five five one and you add it to the previous carrying value because the carrying value's got to come up, right? It's got to end up at six hundred thousand at the end, and that gives me what? Some number, okay? I don't care what it gives me, huh? What is it? <laughs> Five nine two five nine two five six two seven three eight, you said Jordy? Okay. And so on. I like that. That's ten questions. How many did you guys want? Twenty five, so we gotta come up with fifteen more questions. <laughs> All right. Now I'm thinking, you know, I won't do something like this. These would be standalone questions, and then, um, you know, each each bond question will be standalone, and then you'll have a full-blown problem of some sort. John. Which one? This one? Chapter seven. <coughs>
If you tell me which one you're talking about, I'll I'll put it up. I'll put the answers up. Okay. Well, this one's got the answers, guys. And um, I'm looking at the clock. What do we got? A quarter till. So why don't we? You want to go to jail or you want to go home? Jail means we're gonna do more work. Home means we go home. Okay, Friday, um, okay, hang, hang on, guys. Friday, um, what do you got, the Pizza Hunt or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, so Friday, you're, the class starts at 7 then? Yeah. After the pizza thing? Okay, I think it's uh, worthwhile to come in, and I'm going to ask, Ale I'm going to go with our original plan. I'm going to ask Alex to do... Uh, ratio analysis for you, okay? So his name's Alex, right? Alan. Alan. <laughs> Cut, edit. Alan, I'm going to ask him to do um, is ratio. I'm going to ask him to do the ratio analysis, chapter 13. Oh, I'm also going to put up some more questions in Connect for people that have Connect. I'll select some more questions to give you some extra practice. Um, Jesse asked for that, so I think that's not a bad idea. And I'm going to have to, uh, Christy mentioned to me that I haven't put homework questions in for Chapter 13. So I'll put in the homework questions for 13. Alan will talk to you about Chapter 13. Now, what does that mean? That means Monday we got to do what? Chapter 11, Chapter 12, and do something to get you ready for the exam, right? So um, we got a lot of work left to do. Question? Um, I'm sorry. Tell me again. No, no, I understand what you said. Tell me your name again. I'm sorry. Lily. Lily suggested, guys, listen up. Lily suggested that you watch the lectures for chapter 11 and chapter 13, and then I mean in chapter 12, and then we just go ahead and review it. I'll tell you what, don't worry about that, okay. watching the lectures. I'll, I'll get it in. We'll do it. Okay, we'll get it done uh, one way or the other. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not throwing out your idea. I'm just thinking I'm going to take the onus off of you guys and put it on me, okay? So we'll get through it um, by going through those. And um, what I think we'll do is for the practice midterm, what we'll do is we'll go back to chapter 7 and 10. So we will have been, been talking about 11 and 12, and then rather than try to go through an entire practice midterm, I'll come up with some questions for 7 and 10, which is the back chapters. It is what it is, guys. Okay, we don't have a lot of time this uh, semester, this summer session. So, question. It is. Yeah, it's recorded. It's it's ratio analysis, guys. And the reason I'm thinking that Alan should do it because he said he was an anal an analyst at uh, Kaiser, so he might have some you know some you know good examples of where he uses the um, he uses stuff. Okay, so. Um,